You know what I love about this sound is actually you. Everyone in it has got this massive soul. We're looking for people. Hello everyone, welcome along to another episode of the Luton Town Supporters Trust podcast. I'm Kev, your host as always. I'm very excited about this episode because it's the big one for the Trust, because for the first time ever, we're not just coming at you in audio format, we're coming at you in video format as well. So if you're listening to this in your normal podcast places and you want to actually watch the podcast, head to our YouTube channel or via all the links that we've put out, both where you've seen this podcast and on social media and things like that. If you are watching us on video already, you'll see that we're working on a brand new set, which has been designed and set up by my good friend James here alongside me. <laughs> Brilliantly constructed, really good stuff, and uh, I thank him immensely for doing that. Unfortunately, whilst the set looks great, I can't get all the makeup to get these two guests uh, looking <laughs> equally as good, but I'd like to welcome Tony Murray, the Trust Chair, and James Cunliffe, the Lutonian Journalist. Tony, I'll start with you. I mean, brilliant, really. We're coming in Premier League team now, and we're coming at everyone with the Premier League podcast. Oh, it's brilliant. Um, you know, we've stepped the game up, uh, similar to the, the club. They've had to step the game up as well, and uh, it was a great start at Brighton apart from the result and the train chaos afterwards but um, enjoyable day out uh, I think it was one o'clock in the morning when I finally got home I was absolutely shattered but um, I enjoyed it I enjoyed it and it, it was nice to visit little Japan well we'll come on to the game in a minute but James the set looks absolutely fantastic a lot of your work went behind it so well done with that you must be delighted I am yeah it's come together really nicely um uh, I sort of had a vision for it, but I didn't know it would come up uh, this good. So I'm pretty pleased about that. I've watched plenty of uh, videos of how to do it um, because it's not my usual forte. But yeah, I'm um, looking forward to this. Um, unlucky to all you lot, I have to look at us. But uh, <laughs> uh, yeah, it's been great. We Obviously, we've been doing this since League Two and we are the only football podcast ever to go to League Two to the Premier League. So it's quite right that we stepped it up and, and, and got involved in the video game as well. Absolutely it is. Okay, so for the remainder of this season, every podcast that we do revolving around a Premier League football match will be at this set via video and audio format. We will still be doing other podcasts. We can't guarantee they'll all be on video. We'll do our best to get as many of them on video as we can. But they'll all be in all of your usual audio places right throughout the season. So we will be doing match preview podcasts, match review podcasts. And we'll also do our monthly podcast, chatting the fat over all things football as ever. So you are welcome with us for this podcast, which is the review of the Brighton game. Usually these reviews will come along on the same weekend that the matches take place. But obviously, while we've been setting up our set, getting our equipment and everything, we've just taken a little bit of time. We've had that break for the Burnley game getting cooled off and we've used it to our advantage. But this is the Brighton Review podcast. And Tony, as you just said, I mean, obviously there were a few teething problems, results, transport and everything else. But wasn't it fantastic to see Luton Town in the Premier League? Oh, got a long time coming, a long time coming. Uh, something to really look forward to. And uh, I'm looking forward to a great season ahead. Whether we win, lose or draw, I'm going to enjoy it. Indeed, yeah. I mean, James, like you said, we are the only podcast that's been running from League Two right through to the Premier League. And we've now seen Luton in the Premier League. I know Holiday stopped you from being at the Amex Stadium, but you've waited a long time for Luton to be in the Premier League. And, uh, well, it's, it's going to come thick and fast from here on in too. Yeah, I mean, it's a day I never thought, I never ever thought would happen, really. I mean, I started covering the club in the Championship and then three successive relegations and five years in the Conference. And I think when we started this in League Two, just delighted to be in League Two, weren't we? And uh, couldn't have predicted what what has happened over the last nine years. So it was, um, yeah, typical me that I thought we'd be in the Championship this year. So I booked <laughs> holiday and couldn't go to the first uh, first game. But um, yeah, it looked like a, a great day out. Uh, and I think it seems that everybody treated it in the manner it, it was. I know we did the preview podcast for that that game and I, I, couldn't, I couldn't see a victory and I didn't predict a victory. and It's not that I'm singing about that. It's just that Brighton and teams like Brighton are not the games that we need to win here. Um, so if you can take something great, if not, try and take some positives. And I think there were some positives. 
Yeah, we'll come on to the positives and negatives in a minute, Tony. But what did you make of the game itself? I mean, obviously we lost 4-1, which was disappointing, really. Partly because I thought we gave a much better account of ourselves than that scoreline suggested. Yeah, I I think, to be honest with you, that the, the scoreline flattered them a little bit. Because, two, as Rob has said, 2-1, uh, you know... Uh, going into the last 10 minutes and I, I thought that Brighton were looking a bit rocky at that sp- at, at that point and I thought we might be able to get something out of the game but you know I, I, I don't want to knock any players but um, Pelly what was he doing <laughs> I mean if somebody playing for me on a Sunday morning did that I'd be going mental at them but you know you've, you've got to give Pelly credit for what he's done and you know he normally makes one mistake a season doesn't he so hopefully that's out of his system but that gave them the third and then they caught us on the break um, while we were going forward trying to get something out of the game and you could see in that last goal their quality one chance bang it's in the back of the net we were fortunate in the fact that they hit the woodwork a, a, a few times and Kaminsky had a good game but you know, you've got to take into account it, it, it's our first game at that level, playing a very good side. Brighton and Omar, it, 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 they're a good side. And plus as well, we're trying to bed in some new players as well. So it's going to take us a little while to get up to speed. But, I, I, you know, I think we can do it. I, th- I think we'll, we'll rise to the challenge. We've bought well. Um, you know, I thought Morris looked really good. He looked like he could cope with the, the step up. Um, Chong looked good. Um, perhaps needs to track back a bit more, a bit better. But um, you know, and and Tom Lockyer is trying to get back up to speed after what happened to him at Wembley. Uh, and obviously, they've got to get used to Mads playing with them at the back as well. But I thought Kabori had a good game as well. So I I I, I, I thought. You know, there's potential there. There's enough to build on. And I remember after the game feeling the same way as we did that first season in the championship, Think, oh, we're going to be able to step up to this level. You know, we're coming up from League One. It, it's a big step. Are we going to do that? Now, I know the step into the Premier League is a lot more than the step up from, you know, uh, League One to championship. But I, I think we can get there. But we've got a young side. They're hungry. And they're going to learn from this, put it behind them in the right way and and look forward to the game against Chelsea. Yeah, indeed, you're right. We'll come on to uh, the the Chelsea game in another episode of the podcast. But James, one of the most surreal things, still surreal actually, is that Luton are on match of the day this season. Uh, Obviously, there were a few sort of controversial comments from uh, Mrs Shearer and co uh, on that that night. But actually, you look at Brighton since then and we, we gave a perfectly fair account of ourselves. Yeah, I mean, I wasn't surprised by the the fact that uh, Alan Shearer said that. <laughs> I don't. I almost kind of don't think people should get too upset about it, really, because Alan Shearer started his career at Southampton in '88, so he had a couple of seasons in the first division, and he played. I've looked at the stats. He played. He started against Luton five times, scored against them three times. So back then, when he's a young lad coming up, must have thought, well, Luton are. Luton and nothing really, I'll score against him all the time. And then he didn't have to bother with Luton for 30 odd years because he was Mr. Premier League. He just didn't have, have to think about them. And so he's not the greatest pundit in the world. He's in, for me, he's in your Martin Keown bracket of, look at this replay. I'm going to tell you what he's just done rather than the modern breed that sort of analyse it, which I, which I much prefer. Um, uh, you know, and that's kind of what he did. And, um, you can't expect them that they've watched the entire game. Um, and if he had, he might have come up with a different conclusion. But he's just going along with the the party line, really, that, that Luton are going to be the whipping boys and they're going to go out. And, you know, the, the score line played into that. And that's all That's all he said, really. I mean, you know, <clears throat> he wasn't particularly fair in the tone. I think there's probably an element that he said Luton are naive and, and they probably were. But, um, you know, it's... If if you look at it that Luton were in that game up until the 85th minute, that's pretty decent for a start. Yeah. And like I say at the beginning, you're not expected to beat Brighton. And I, I didn't think they would, but um, we know where the games are that, that are going to really mean something. And um, 
yeah, expect more of, the, more of that, not just from Alan Shearer, from plenty of people, and just don't get too riled up about it, really, because we know and what we are. You've got to remember, it's just his opinion. Mm. You know, yeah. you know, so, and we've all got opinions, and everybody always sees a different game, don't they? Mm. And, uh, you know, I didn't watch Match of the Day that night, and I didn't know about his comments till the fo- following morning, and I thought, well, yeah, great, you know. Um that's your opinion, mm. you know, and, uh, you know, Mr. Charisma, eh? you know. <laughs> yeah, despite looking even worse than what we did, uh, Wolves weren't naive, mm. apparently, on match of the day. Uh, Brighton suddenly become really good side in the intervening seven days. But uh, there you go. James is right. Don't get too hit up on what everyone says, particularly old uh, past it pundits like uh, Messrs. Shearer and co. Um Positives from the day, Tony. You highlighted a few of them uh, a minute ago. Hey, Carl Morris, you're absolutely right. Thomas Kaminsky, you're mm. spot on. But I actually thought the game changed when Jacob Brown came off the bench. Oh, yes. Considering he was only signed two days prior to the Brighton game. I, I thought that was a really good cameo from him and there's certainly something to build on there. And and the same for Chio as well. He came on and, and, and did well. I was a little bit disappointed with Elijah. Um but uh, you know it's it's it, it's a big step, and and they're not all going to take to it straight away. Um, but I thought uh, Brown was fantastic when he came on, and it's just a shame he couldn't keep that volley down, wasn't it? But uh, no, it 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 it, it looked good. The, the one thing I, I I do want to mention is is about the Luton support down there as well. I'm so so proud of my fellow Hatters. All the atmosphere, all the singing came from Luton, and. The funniest bit for me was when they were singing to Brighton Conference Champions, you'll never say that. I thought that was <laughs> funny. But it was great. And, and, and that's the sort of thing we need for every game. You know, right from before the game, right to the end. When the players came over at the end, even though we'd, we'd, we'd suffered a, a heavy defeat, you know, they got behind them, they cheered them on. And, every, and, and again, that's what we need to do every game, regardless of the result. Yeah, absolutely. You're you're dead on. Uh, really good atmosphere right throughout the uh, the day, from from being in Brighton itself to okay. getting the train up to the game. The only time you heard from the Brighton fans was when they scored. Yeah, you and that really, just cheered. Yeah, you didn't uh, really hear from them much I, then I, either. I think that's going to be a feature, really. And I think I, I said this in one of the um, podcasts after we got promoted: is that teams like Brighton who now are looking to Europe. They are looking at Luton like they should beat them and they're not really that interested. And there's, there's going to be a lot of that. The top half of the table are going to be like that. Mm-hmm. Um, but it's up to Luton fans to do the business and enjoy it because you've not been there before and just make all the noise possible. Because, I, I, you know, I've covered a bit of Premier League about 10 years ago and it can be sterile, mm. but it's up to Luton fans not to make it. In that. I t- I, they weren't penalties either. No. They were got to be two of the worst penalties. I mean, Pedro, you know, he likes throwing himself about a bit, didn't he? But I honestly thought the referee probably thought about that and I think he gave us a penalty to even it up, I think, because that, that wasn't a penalty either. It was just two ridiculous it, decisions. It was it was soft, wasn't it? That's yeah. the letter of law, if you saw yeah. the World Cup final, uh, where England got um, a penalty against them, a lioness, as I'm talking. I, I generally didn't think that was a penalty. I guess it hits the hand, but... The hand was now in an unnatural position. I don't, as as I don't want to talk about that, but I disagree with you. I think it was a penalty oh, because think? she moved her, hat, her, hat, her arm towards the ball. So. Yeah, oh, well, but it's, that's all moved. That's all moved. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I was biased, but you're yeah. going to get a lot of that. Yeah, I mean, we're, we're going to see VAR play a hell of a part in the season, really. And we just hope that that old adage, which is proved not true scientifically, <laughs> uh, that you hope it evens out. Well, they did over the course of the season. They did over the course of that ninety minutes, didn't they? Because, like Tony said, they were both bullshit penalties, really. To, to be honest, but James, the one concern I had this season, and to be fair, I have not got many concerns this season because when well, I don't like to use the term free hit, but there's not as much pressure on us as there are on other teams. But one of the concerns I had this season, we didn't score oceans of goals in the championship. One nil was our forte, really. Could we therefore score enough goals in the Premier League to keep us up? I wasn't really worried about defence and I know we've conceded four goals but we will improve defensively. Obviously Mads missed some training and the game in Germany because of illness. Tom's still getting his way back within himself. Amari's pretty much been non-stop right through the summer and, and so on and so on. 
But every time we went forward, we looked like we were going to score at the Amex. And for me, that's a massive positive. Yeah, absolutely. And um, you, you've got to have that firepower and that strength in depth. Um, I'm, I'm pleased to hear that Luton looked better when Brown and um, Chio came on because that's the whole point of them being signed, isn't it? Really, mm. uh, the, it, Chio's pace is incredible, and um, Brown's one of these signings where I don't think Stoke were particularly bothered about him going, but it's a proper Luton sign in that. But I, I reckon they've done, they've done a hell of a lot of homework on him, and I think that they see a huge amount of potential, and he's young as well, um, and he's big and strong uh, centre forward, and it, it's similar in the vein of um, you know you, you sign Morris, he's not really broke 10 goals really in his career. And then he goes and scores 20 in his first season for Luton last season. And I'm not saying that Jacobs Brown's going to go and score 20, but if he does, he's going to be worth a hell of a lot of money. But it, that's potential, isn't it? I tell you what, I, I've, you're saying about us not looking like scoring goals. I think we look like scoring more than uh, quite a few of the teams in that mini league that we're going to be in at the bottom of it. I mean, you know, some of those Fans have got to be looking at their sides and thinking, where are the goals coming? Like Everton, Wolves. Certainly Wolves, I'd say. Sheffield United. Uh, Wolves had Crystal a Palace chances, as well. Zaha's gone, so, you know. Mm. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, Wolves had a couple of chances. And, and of really course, un unconfident. Mitrovic has gone from Fulham as well now. So, you know, I think it's all to play for. I really do. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, there's a lot of clubs um, who... I guess unity wise uh, and, and club feeling wise aren't in the same position as Luton and that can play in, into Luton's hands and that could be a benefit and you've got to just try to exploit that. And the other positive James was pretty much every result that weekend that could have gone our way did go our way and of course we've had a weekend since then and to be fair most of them have gone our way since then as well. Wolves have lost twice, uh, Sheffield United have lost twice. Everton have lost twice. All three of them look absolute basket cases, particularly in front of goal. Crystal Palace lost at the weekend. You know, I know West Ham beat Chelsea, but really Chelsea looked abs looked an absolute shambles. Burnley lost on the opening weekend, albeit to Man City. But I know that there's a, an awful lot of fear about Burnley uh, from a few experts that I kind of trust. So really and truly, although we got absolutely gubbed, it could have been a lot worse. Yeah, and just look at the table. Not in the relegation zone. Yeah, that's, I'm what really I'm playing without game. Playing. Yeah. that's what I absolutely love about this Premier League. You can leave a ground second from bottom in the table, and by the time you get on a train to come home, you're third from bottom in the <laughs> table. And then the next time you play, you're fourth from bottom in the mm. table. I mean, can we, you know, it's just as, as, as a certain fat politician across the pond would say, can we just stop the count right now? <laughs> yeah. I mean, yeah, it's looking pretty good at the moment. And um, it was always going to be a tough start. Uh, and everybody was really excited and kind of maybe got a little bit carried away with it. Um, realistically, if the Burnley game hadn't been promoted, it was an early chance to pick up some points, I think. But, it, you know, it hasn't worked out that way. And, you know, you've got to go to Chelsea and, and, and try and get something. But, you know, we'll speak about that in another podcast. But I'm reasonably hopeful for it. Negatives, Tony. I mean, you know, we're not going to be too negative on this podcast as a whole, but there were, well, there were one or two. The defence, it just looked patchy didn't it it looked yeah. like a team that or a defensive unit that were probably short of a gallop for the want of a better phrase yeah I, I agree with you there I, I mean I've already mentioned Pelly's mistake um, some of the passing wasn't what it could have been um, and he, he said you know Tom didn't look on top of his game on the day Amari played well but a mad you know, yeah, I'm thinking the only one back there who's got any pace is Amari. So they've got to be on top of their game. They've got to be re reading the game better. Um, but as I said earlier, it's early days, Kev. Yeah, it is. Uh, James, one other kind of negative, but I, I think we all trust him to come good, was marvellous. He just he was another one mm. who kind of, understandably, didn't come until quite late in pre-season. We don't actually know quite how much he was doing at Aston Villa whilst we, he was waiting for his transfer to us, but he just kind of looked a little bit off the pace. But he'll come good. He's a professional. He's the one that knows what that level is all about, and we can expect him to improve as it goes along. Yeah, we know he will. We, we've seen him last season and everything that he provided that team he, he can do again it's um you know it's a team with five debutants who never played competitively for the club and everybody obviously in their premier league debut um yeah no one in that team played premier league today yeah with the exception of marvelous and yeah. chong chong also mm. played four that's or five right games. yeah that's right so um you know 
it can happen. You, you, you know, it can happen. And um, if you're not seeing a lot of the ball, which Brighton will do that to most teams, they did that to Liverpool last season. So, you know, you, you've got to take it for what it is, really. And um, yeah, those, don't get. I don't think anyone is down about it, really. I, I really haven't got that impression, you know, uh, apart from your pundits and, and everybody else who's uh, not connected with Luton, who's, who's expecting Luton to get um, gubbed every week and, and go down with probably the worst points tally. I don't think that will happen, but from a Luton perspective, I think everybody's quite, you know, they're, they're seeing the positives. And that's really what I wanted to see at the start of the season is that don't get sucked into this doom and gloom of it. We're here. We're going to try and make a great go of it. We all know the end game and, 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 you know, the money from this season is helping that. And then it's power court. And then that's the future of the club secured. And this is just a season to savor, isn't it? Mm. Yeah, I would agree with that. Uh, Tony, if I had to push you on one player who impressed you at the Amex in the Luton shirt, who would who would you say impressed you the most? Kaminsky, I think. He had a really good game, really good debut for us. Um, and considering everybody was panicking before he was signed, we hadn't got a goalkeeper or anything, but I thought he looked impressive and I think he's only going to get better for us. And he's got competition now with uh, Kroll coming in as well. So... Yeah, I think I think to be fair, um, you know Kaminsky, and after that probably Morris. Yeah, he must have looked very scary, Kaminsky, because uh, he managed to put Xiao Pedro off from two yards out. Mm. If we see a worse miss than that in the thirty-seven games that are to follow, uh, well, I'm looking forward to seeing it. I just hope it ain't from someone in an orange shirt because that was an absolute shambles of a miss. Um, James, did you see enough on match of the day to pick a player out? I've seen enough from the clips that I've watched afterwards as well to say that um, Issa Kabore looks like a really exciting talent. Um, you know, pacey, can get up and down, defends well. Um, yeah, it's a really exciting buy, which you kind of always thought it would be. You know, when we started this podcast seven seasons ago, you wouldn't say that Luton would be signing players that played in the Champions League or play for Marseille. And look, that this is where we are now. Mm. And we've got those, those players. And I think everybody... And, and it's so rare, I think, in football. Like, so many people are just so supportive of the recruitment work that this club does and, and, uh, and backs what people do in the club to, to bring in players. Not everyone's worked out, but I don't really think anyone's been a flop. There's situations that the club has moved quicker than other than the players have. And, you know, the, you've got the, the, the handful of players that aren't squad numbered this season and are probably going to be going on their way. And that's not their... That's not their fault. The club's just moved faster than everyone else. And we've got to this point where signed players like Issa Gabore and, you know, for a lad that can't speak the lingo and, um, well, he probably can, to be fair. He's been at Man City, but um, I'm probably doing him a disservice. But to come in and uh, and play like that um, against Brighton uh, in particular, I think is very promising. There's there's one other player actually I, I think deserves a mention as well because he played very well in his debut for us was Ryan Giles. I thought he looked really good. Um, the crossing was fantastic. Such an upgrade. Um, no disrespect to Alfie, but uh, I thought Giles looked really good. And once we are firing on all cylinders, it shows you we've got some serious firepower. Yeah, I mean, his crossing is going to be a huge benefit to yeah. those forwards that we already have at the club last season and the ones that have just come in. If, they, if they're if they not salivating over those sorts of balls, then he shouldn't be a striker. I would imagine that uh, Carlton, you know, loves it, you know, getting on the end of some of those crosses. Yeah, you're spot on about Kabore. I mean, obviously he kept Matoma largely quiet. I know Matoma assisted the first goal, but really he was much more of a factor in Wolves' second, sorry, in Brighton's second game at Wolves than he was against us and that's that's to Kabore's credit obviously he went off midway through the second half after being booked which I thought was a harsh booking um, but yeah definitely promise there he might not know the lingo but he knows how to get up and down that line and uh, like we said in the preview se- uh, season preview podcast that's exactly what we've always wanted from our fullbacks and what it looks like those two are going to provide us with OK, that is it for this episode of the podcast Luton Town are in the Premier League we've seen the first game it didn't go the way we wanted it to But there's 37 more to come, many of which are much, much bigger and much more important than Brighton away. But it's good to get the unknown out of the way now. The players are going to know what they're up against. Us as fans kind of had a taste of it all and and it it all becomes a little bit more normal with every game from here. 
and I'm sure the results will do too. Until the next time. Thank you very much for listening to the podcast or watching us if you've watched us on YouTube for the first time. I'd like to say a few thank yous before we um, disappear. Thank you to the High Town Club, of which uh, they are putting us up uh, this season. This is, it is from here where we're recording right now. I'd also like to say thank you very much to Sean Grant and the Wolf Gang for our wonderful new intro, which we hope you all enjoy. And to Ed Smith Creative for giving us all of our fantastic new 2023 24 images we're really grateful for all of those people and we're grateful for you for watching and listening james tony it's been fantastic until next time thanks very much and goodbye bye Actually, you, everyone in it has got this massive soul.